Hello and thank you for joining us on Newsweek, where we highlight some of the biggest stories that made the headlines recently. I am Marco Tabo. This week, Dangote Lumelu Rewane on board as Tinubu inaugurates economic team. Also, court affirms Amawile 24 others as Rivers lawmakers. Later on the show, customs intercept containers carrying arms worth 13.9 billion naira. All the details in a moment. Stay with us. This week, President Bola Tinubu inaugurated the Presidential Economic Coordination Council, PECC, as part of strategies to win the country out of its current economic state. The inauguration of the council members came after three months of establishing the committee in March 2024. Members of the council consist government officials, key players in the private sector, and business consultants, including President of the Dangote Industries Limited, Aliko Dangote, Chairman United Bank of Africa, UBA, Tony Lumelu, and Chief Executive Officer, Financial Derivatives Company Limited, Bismarck Rwane. The PECC were presented with the President's emergency plan to rejig the economy of the country over the next six months and are expected to submit a monthly report to the President. Now, joining me to discuss this issue is uh, Porube Geshen uh, on Zoom, but we're hoping to establish connections with him in a bit. But, of course, I still have... Uh, my in-house guest right here with me, Justice Ojeno. Good to have you on the show. It's my pleasure to join you. Fantastic. Now we understand now that the economic committee, uh, the economic team inaugurated by the president, uh, are obviously successful tycoons in their various fields of business. Now, from your perspective, what impact do we hope to expect from this team? Okay, for me, I think that uh, they have actually hit the ground running. Okay. And uh, I expect something uh, highly reasonable especially because, just like you said, they are, they are hands-on people. Mm -hmm. They are persons who have their skin directly in the game. So, they, Dangote can tell you about the Nigerian economy. Mm -hmm. Tony Elumelu can tell you about the Nigerian economy. So, mm -hmm. I expect nothing short of a miracle for them okay. in, the, in the short run and eventually too, because they are in it for the long haul, mm -hmm. in the long run. So, I okay. think they will be good. All right, let us look at it. Now, the mandate that has been given to the council is to stimulate growth and in critical areas of uh, sectors of the economy. Now, now under the fiscal measures, uh, it is understood that over 650 billion naira facility will provide lower cost, short term facilities to youth owned businesses, manufacturers, MSMEs across various industries, food processing. Now, here's a catch. Under this financing plan, the Manufacturing uh, Stabilization Fund will be provided to rejuvenate about 250 companies and deliver a low cost of 9.0 to 11.0% long-term facilities to large, medium, scale, and light uh, manufacturers that produce finished goods. Now, how innovative is this move? Do you think a revival is finally on the cards? I think so. Okay. Because I think that the economy has really uh, taken a, a, a dive. And if you observe the commentary that's provided by Tony Lumelu, it is that with this uh, economic team in place, and especially with the injection of about two trillion, two trillion naira to uh, into the economy over the course of six months, we, we are we are seeing a rejuvenation of of the of the Nigerian economy. Also, one of the major targets of the of this uh, team is to ensure that our production stays at. Uh, two million, uh, at least two million barrels mm -hmm. per day, yeah. and w w once that is done, it will ensure that uh, our foreign reserve is still intact. And we saw that it hit an all-time high recently with 34.7 billion dollars uh, over the course of this week. So uh, we feel that with all these measures that's put in place, with these uh, eggheads having direct the direct ear mm -hmm. of the persons uh, who are in charge of the economy, the, the finance. Minister, which is the who is the coordinating minister of the economy, uh, the economic minister, economic and budget planning minister, and the president himself. Mm. So we feel that since they are the ones that are that are really running the private sector, and they tell the they tell the government of the day that okay, government, uh, this and this and these are things that we think uh, you should do, uh, with and the government listens to them. We think that it will be on the on the upward trajectory. Also, we must also note the the role of. Uh, uh, general advisors like uh, Mr. Rewani, mm -hmm. 
mm. not just a person who are who are who are, who are in the game like like a, a Dangote or or a Tony Elumelo and their likes, but a Rwan who is a renowned economist, also bringing the futuristic theoretical basis to. Mm to economic development to the team. So I expect something very excellent from the team. And now you have highlighted some of the areas where I feel we might have that rejigging. Now you cannot wish away the corruption in the system, the loopholes that has been there, and of course, uh, you know, the backlog of, uh, you know, atrocities that trail some of these sectors. Now, how do you think that can be purged for us to have a clear path with what we're actually trying to do right now with this economic team? empowering and further making the uh, organizations and agencies like the Independent Corrupt Practices Organization uh, uh, Commission and the uh, Economic and Financial Crimes Commission more independent. If we make them more independent and we, we give them more powers to be able to go after persons who may want to be stumbling blocks for personal reasons, civil servants, for example. We saw what the president uh, did when, when he went to, I think, Qatar. To, uh, he, he told them generally that if you see any civil servant that, that tries to, uh, to, to be a stumbling block when it comes to uh, uh, this uh, stand in the way of our economic rejigging, you have to let them, you have to let me know. And when you let me know, just be very, very sure that I'm going to drop uh, the, the sledgehammer on such a very minister or, or civil servant so that as much as possible, we shouldn't let selfish parochial private interests deprive the generality of, of, of Nigerians from benefiting mm. from, the, from the benefits and fruits of good governance. All right, you, you've, you've said that. Now, the stabilization program also includes energy uh, security initiatives, such as power, oil, and gas. Now, we are looking at uh, the aim is to increase on-grid electricity to be delivered to homes and businesses from about 4.5 gigawatts to six gigawatts in six months. Now we've been having breakdown of the national grid every now and then. Yes. In fact, the uh, the joke out there now is almost every market day, you know, <laughs> the uh, the grid just unfortunately, and unfortunately, now, so. How do you think we can actually achieve this particular target? with the breakdown of the grid every now and then? Okay, I, I feel that uh, there is also something being done on gas. I think in, in the next one month, there's a project that I've been working on, I think uh, Project B3 or something, that has been in the works for about 17 years now. It's going to be completed about in, in about one month's time. And I think that once that is completed, we are going to have more abundance of, of, of gas. And, uh, and uh, there's going to, there are also deliberate, we've seen that there are deliberate policies on power, even though there are people who have gone to court to try to stop uh, the new regime, uh, the ban A, ban B, ban C discrimination from, from taking effect. So with those, if those are put in place and, and more initiatives are, are, are brought in and private sectors, are, private sector players are allowed more into the system, we think that uh, we will get closer to El Dorado. All right, b before I let you go off this topic, that the president actually stressed the importance of public-private partnerships in driving economic reforms. Now, are we finally heading towards the growth we all see? I think that we have always had public-private partnership, okay. but maybe it, it is not, not on this fair. spectrum. Yes, okay. this spectrum is way higher, Okay, and we think it should be encouraged further. All right, well, uh, we have to take a break now. When we return, Newsweek continues in a moment. Stay with us. Uh, thank you for staying with us. This week, the Court of Appeal sitting in Abuja affirmed Speaker. Uh, once you see the CTC of the judgment, you will just know that, okay, uh, it's a very, very easy one for the great uh, Justice of the Court of Appeal, Justice, uh, able, Honorable Justice Jimmy Olukayadi Bada. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a very straight one. It's, it's almost like a one-liner because it's, it's, it's obvious even to the blind that the state high court never ever had jurisdiction in the first place to give maybe it's an ex parte uh, order in this situation mm. or even an uh, interim order in this jurisdiction in this uh, situation because uh, the constitution is extremely and explicitly, explicitly clear mm. that matters uh, of that uh, Matthews, caliber. Yeah. It is a federal high court that has jurisdiction, and we have to ensure that as much as possible, we stop uh, this practice of whichever party is in power always have uh, the state high court as its, uh, as its ally in order to be able to carry out any of its, any of its uh, intentions. 
I think that as much as possible, the judiciary must be allowed to be as independent as it can possibly be, so that when they, when they are faced with any tough political decision, they will still always land on the side of justice, and they won't just merely be hatchet men for, for politicians. All right, I, I want to take you up on this. Uh, I'm not hoping to push you on the edge that much. Now, obviously, this is already looking messy. Now, where do you think it all fell apart for Fubara? Because he's at the center of it all as a governor of River State. Maybe I won't say it fell apart for him. But as it is, we have to note that no court so far has gone into the meat of the matter. What Yet. Uh, yet. What uh, the, the, the Court of Appeal Justice, Able Justice, just said that is that the, federal, the state high court in that, in that case never had jurisdiction. It's a one-liner uh, judgment. It's almost like a one-liner judgment, just like ju judgments that we see from the courts of the United States when they, mm -hmm. when they feel that, when the Supreme Court of the United States, when they feel that there is not really much to talk about in this situation. So until it is really argued until it is argued that whether uh, they have defected or they have not defected, that's when we can know whether there is already justice in this matter or not. But as it is, and we must always remember the words of our courts when it comes to jurisdiction, mm. it doesn't matter how intelligently a matter is conducted. Mm. It doesn't matter who, how many senior advocates were on the matter. It doesn't matter uh, how, many, how many number of uh, yeah, maybe electorates are on one side of the argument or, or, or the other. It doesn't matter how fair or unfair a particular matter sounds. If a court never had jurisdiction in the first place, even on the day of judgment, mm. The matter, the court will be the, the, the court will not be able to go ahead with the matter. Okay. So we must ensure first that the court has jurisdiction before the court goes into the meat of any matter. And if it wants to decide on any matter, it can it can still give its ruling on jurisdiction on the day it's giving judgment. Okay. Now I, I, I'm, I've been told that uh, Porobe Gershon is uh, standing by online to actually give us his verdict on what's happening right now. But well, good evening, sir. Uh, quickly, uh, court affirming Amawule 24 others as Rivers Law because what's your reaction to the judgment and uh, the implication on the politics of Rivers State? Thank you. Thank you. The position is this. The law is that uh, every court has an inherent jurisdiction. Every court has an inherent jurisdiction to entertain any matter. But in this circumstance, the law, the, the official court has pronounced that uh, the state high court lacks jurisdiction, which is the law. However, the justices, in their level opinion, did not dive into uh, whether or not the members, the Oscar members, are still members of the assembly. The only statement, pronouncement has to the jurisdiction of the courts. And other than parties should return to uh, status quo. Uh, status quo. And so, by status quo, they, in the eyes of the law, they should, they should return to where they were before they come to the courts. And so, where they were, where that they were not members of the assembly. The constitution is very clear. The, the court has made pronouncement in the in that law against Gary. The case of that law against Gary, the law is clear. Section 109, sub 1, paragraph G is clear. It is unambiguous. And so the learned uh, uh, justice of the Court of Appeal were very mindful that the, the matter is before the elementary brother, and so they did not dive into the substantive matter on his merit. They were very no pronouncement on the jurisdiction of the same high court. So I agree with them. But that the position is. The assembly members, in as much as the former speaker then, that is the name, we have declared that it's vacant as required. We remain non members. Okay, uh, quickly now, let's, uh, let me take you up on this quickly. Now, it's being argued that uh, a state of emergency might likely be in the works for River State should the crisis persist. Do you also share that sentiment? Uh, the, I, 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 I do not know the line of that reasoning. Okay. The state of emergency is only declared where there is total breakdown of law and order. 
in a, in a situation where there is a, this is a pure constitutional matter, the activities of state is going on, the affairs of the state is going on, and so how come or how will it arise the issue of uh, state of emergency? I don't subscribe to that. It has never gone into that state. It has never had, the situation has never affected has never affected the economy of the state. It has never affected the economy of the nation. Everything is moving. It's a matter that is before the court. All right. The kind of state of emergency amounts to usurping the powers of the court. The court has made pronouncement and continues to make pronouncement. All right. Not until there is total breakdown of law and order. Okay. All right, uh, Justice, before we go to the next story, you wanted to react to okay, yeah, we, briefly, quickly. To a large extent, I may have to disagree with my learned, uh, possibly Olive. senior colleague, uh, Mr. Purobi, on the interpretation of Section 109G that he gave. I feel that the implication of the, of the Court of Appeal decision for everybody to go back to status quo, status quo was that they were lawmakers and the other man, Amewole was speaker. Okay. Before the decision of the court that says that, okay, they, they, they be evicted, which is the decision of the state high court. Right. So I feel that status quo does not, and we have not gotten into the meat of the matter. Section 109G has not been interpreted. It's until the court interprets it and concludes on it. That's when we can say that the situation has changed. So whether they have decamped or not, not. it's still a matter before competent courts of law. All right, now let's move on to our last story for the evening. Over the course of the week, the Nigerian Customs Service intercepted nine containers carrying offensive items worth 13.9 billion naira. The seized items included 844 rifles and 112,500 pieces of live ammunition, illicit drugs and secondhand clothes. The Controller General NCS Adewale Adini noted that one of the containers which originated from Turkey raised concerns due to the number of risks associated with the importation. Three suspects were already arrested in connection with the seizures after getting a detention warrant from a competent court of justice. Oh, I still have uh, Purubi Geshon in the house with me. Uh, he's obviously online with us. And of course, Justice Jenner is right here. Now, Justice, very quickly, we must first commend the Nigerian Customs for their unwavering commitment towards exposing uh, smugglers. Now, containers carrying arms worth 13.9 billion naira is very worrying. <sighs> it's chaos looming. It is. It is. And for this to have been intercepted, they, we, we must have it somewhere in our hearts that it's even possible that maybe some have escaped. Mm. For, every, for everyone, and it, it's, it's the same thinking we must also have with drugs, uh, with hard drugs. For everyone we're able to intercept, we must know that maybe some have passed through the cracks. And as much as possible, I must commend uh, members of the, of the custom of Nigeria. And I must ensure, I must also advocate for them to be given more equipment, more scanners at, at various ports of entry. And they should be, we, we must also remember that this was at a private bonded terminal. Mm. So <laughs> what's happening at our bonded, at our private bonded terminal? So some of those things too must be further looked into okay. so in order to ensure that these things that are so disastrous and detrimental to the society, once they are able to escape into the society, are always uh, nipped in the bud. All right, uh, Puribe Gershon, I know you're still hanging there with us. Uh, drugs were also discovered in those containers. Now, those who carry these arms are always under the influence, whether we like it or not. Now, these smugglers, as a matter of fact, what factors are they leveraging on to promote this illegal trade? Well, um, it is it is disheartening. It is disheartening that uh, this calls for synergy among our security agencies again. Mm. Uh, I could recall some years ago when uh, there was calls and clarion calls that uh, there should be establishment of a coastal guard for a shipment of that nature to, to get into the port. There must have been cost, there is a big cost of establishing a coastal guard that would have checked the consignment on board. At the, at the port, there are plethora of agencies of government. And so, why, why allow it to get on land? So, this is a clear for that the government should now revisit the call that, that should be established uh, a coastal guard to segment before this vessel will, will traverse the creeks and get into the port. It is surprising 
that uh, it was on the, the uh, personnel get onshore. That okay. is when it was discovered hmm. that uh, there are explosive uh, ammunition in it. It is, it, is, it, is, it, is, it is the right time that uh, the security agencies work in uh, share the information. And legislation should be put in place towards uh, bringing the culprit to justice. All right, uh, let me take you. The, let me quickly take you on this. Now, your colleague here did, uh, you know, highlight some of the fact that with this discovery, you can only take a wild guess on others that already made it through the ports. Now, what do you think our law enforcement should do now to tackle this situation right now? Quickly, we don't have much time. I think uh, our legislators should consider the aspect of uh, forensic intelligence. Okay. Because the law should be geared towards forensic intelligence. The, our manual le uh, level of inspection, our manual level of carrying on investigation does no longer work. And so part of our law should be that uh, forensic investigation and intelligence should be uh, encouraged. Now in the, in, the, in the world, we have, we have uh, artificial intelligence. Mm. Where issues are discovered in, in the board. And so our laws, our legislators, should so make laws towards uh, of uh, artificial intelligence. All right. Thank you. And meet in the board. All right. Any future occurrence. Thank you very much. Uh, before we go, your final wrap. Okay, for me, I think that uh, we should, just like I said earlier, we should commend uh, the gallant members of, of, yes. of custom. And a lot that has been done pre shipment, because there were a lot of pre shipment investigations. We mean that from before I even got to the point where it started coming, mm -hmm. we should also build on that. Intelligence should, should be pre and during and post. And these officers that are putting their lives on the line mm -hmm. every day, there should be. Uh, more bountiful insurance on their life, and and uh, there should be better better pay, better uh, emoluments and remuneration in order to ensure that they are they always act in the interest of of our country. Justice Ajene has always been it's uh, my it's pleasure. Always a pleasure. It's always always my pleasure. Show. And of course, uh, uh, Mr. Porobi Geshen, thank you so much for your time as well. It is a pleasure. It is a pleasure. All right, thank you. And, uh, and that's our show for today. Remember, you can follow the conversation on our social media platforms at tvcnews.tv, at tvcnews.ng, or on our website at tvcnews.tv. I am Mark Otabo, and until next week, goodbye.